one down 246 to go well yeah I've done them all every year probably will why because there's a couple of things I know one of those things is this and you'll have to forgive what a little bit of uh, traffic noise you might hear we're, we're down close to the road that's why we planted this what we call our man-made forest to give us a barrier for privacy noise and sound um, and it's beautiful I mean gosh we have to I had no intentions of walking around in this video but I'll have to show you some of this forest again uh, I know that if I do the hard work in my younger years and I take care of every single tree that I've planted which why wouldn't I I took the time to dig every single one of them up from all the way up there in the wood line with the forest. And it took two to three years between, it took us about two and a half years to do this. Why wouldn't I take care of it? And I know that uh, if I do the work in my youth, 20 years from now, when I'm old or older for any G gen generational Z, generation Z young people watching this who would say I'm old already, uh, they're gonna give me shade for a lifetime. Um, and, and we're finally getting to sit back and watch them grow like the be beautiful Virginia burning bushes We've got going on here. All of them are so beautiful. So I know that and I also know Well, I know a few other things we can't change other people and it's no one else's responsibility to Bring joy into our life or make us happy than, than ourselves and we likewise can't go out and do the same for other people And so many people spend their entire lifetime never realizing this Look at this it's so beautiful. Oh my gosh. These things grew overnight. Look at this. Maple, cherry, poplar, poplar, mulberry, and it's got little berries on it. They're not ripe yet. Oh my gosh. And we planted them all. We brought them all down two feet high at the most from way back there. So I'm going to give you, I've got a spoiler alert for you here. And while we're walking through this forest, Watch my six. I mean, get my six. Watch what may or may not be back there. Let's see if we can see that car. Barely, barely. So it's serving its purpose. Beautiful locust, beautiful Eastern red cedar. Oh my gosh, it's so beautiful. I just feel like going through here and hugging them all and I'm not even a tree hugger. Um, spoiler alert. I, I made a video a few days ago and I wanna give a shout out to Patricia Burgess, I think is the name. I uh, made a video where I kind of talked about, well, I was talking about a novel I was reading by Edith Wharton uh, called, uh, yeah, and it was called Ethan Frome. And, oh man, look at this, I'm in shade. I, I'm under the canopy of trees that have become a forest that my wife, our son, and myself have planted. It's amazing. Um, well, I finished the novel. And then last night, Dearly and I watched the movie. And once again, Hollywood had an opportunity, a golden opportunity to take a wonderful story, well written with a meaningful theme, and they hacked it up and destroyed it to push their agenda. Um, in the movie, it made it look like Ethan Frome was just this older guy who became very much attracted to a very flirtatious, very much putting herself out there younger woman who was his wife's cousin. Uh, and it made it look like these two were having an affair. They were physically, uh, romantically active, if you know what I mean, trying to keep it PG rated. Not, that's not, the, the, that was never in the book. Those two people never got together. They wanted to, but they knew it was wrong. Uh, but, but here's, here's the opportunity they missed. I'm going to talk about this for a few minutes today. Uh, the guy's wife had borderline personality disorder and this was back the 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 story was written in 1926 and the setting was the 1880s i guarantee you at both times there was no dsm-4 i think they got a dsm-5 now but this condition was not understood now people could tell when other people had it and they avoided them like the plague but i guess there was no help or there was no understanding at all that's Oh, what a beautiful pollinator. She was a bumblebee. Look, this is privet. I'm just, listen, I, I'm saying PG rated. Um, this is something I've never really, this is, this is something that blows my mind about privet. Do you know how these blossoms smell? You can Google this. Look it up on Wikipedia. If you look it up on Wikipedia, uh, it, they'll tell, they'll say a lot of people don't like privet because the blossoms smell like sperm. 
when I first read that, I thought, how? Who came up with that? Who said, oh, yes, let's let's put in the science textbooks that the blossoms smell like sperm. And then I thought, how can how do so many people, you know, it blows my mind. And then then the first time I smelled it, it was like, yeah. And now I'm like, oh, my gosh, I had no clue that that was such a common odor. So the trees thin out as you get down here, as you can tell, because the soil's not as rich. They have less water. And uh, it, we got that other end where they're taller is the part that is closer to blocking the view for, of our house and from our house. So we focused on that more out here. Can't really see our house. So it, it, these were the trees that got planted last, but look how great they're doing. Eastern red bud, over 10 feet tall. Another one over here. So, um... But the point of that story and the theme of that story was, look, when you're with a lunatic who doesn't want help, who has no intentions of getting any help, there's nothing you can do except escape for your own safety. So in the, in the book, in the real story, um, Ethan Frome was with this woman. She was always sick. She was a hypochondriac, always in pain, even though she wasn't. Um, and she was very abusive to him. She was very mean to him. Uh, everything was a crisis. It was always the end of the world. But the movie didn't show that. The movie just made it look like she was kind of like a good wife who maybe lacked personality, but she didn't come across as abusive. And I'm like, Hollywood, why are you doing this? Well, they had to make the middle-aged white guy look like he was a, a piece of crap, is what it was. Um, typical Hollywood stuff. So they really screwed it up. But in the book, uh, this young woman makes him realize, oh my God, there's... Life can be a joyous thing. Life can be filled with joy, and I could be happy on a regular basis. Now listen, here's something else a lot of people don't get in their entire lifetime. And yeah, it's almost 90 degrees right now, so you'll have to forgive my sweat and all this. Um, I was trying to get out here and get this stuff done before the heat set on. It's only like 9 a.m. right now, but it's already hot. Uh, welcome to Virginia summers, and it's still the last day of May. But... Um, uh, Happiness is an emotion typically based upon the results or the outcome of an event. If our favorite team, UVA Cavaliers, win a national championship like they did in 2019, and you're a fan, you're happy. Makes you happy. Um, payday. You see your bank account go up. Makes you happy, right? Joy is, is a state of being, and it's not based upon the outcome or the result of an event. Um, if your life is filled with joy and your team doesn't win or they don't advance to the finals, you're going to be a little deflated, but you're not going to, you're not even going to be unhappy. You're not going to be sad. You're not going to get depressed because you put everything in perspective and you realize it's just a game, though it is wonderful when you win, uh, but your life is filled with so much joy. I, I use this example. I get up at 5.25 every morning, and as soon as I open my eyes and I realize I'm awake, I am instantly excited. I never think about rolling over and going back to sleep for another hour. Even if it's the middle of summer, my kid's finished with school, I don't have anything planned that day. See why we planted the forest? And people think we live by, by, by a four-lane highway. No, we don't. We live out on an old country road, but there's a lot of big trucks out here because there's a lot of farms out here. They bring diesel and feed and all this other stuff. So, uh, and they don't mind laying on those Jake brakes. So, uh, and, ooh, I gotta show you this. I planted 400,000 wildflower seeds up here last summer. They're not supposed to come up till July, but some of them have been coming up and they're gorgeous. You gotta see it. Look at all these trees. Uh, so I get up, man, I am excited to get out of bed, do my morning run, do my morning bike ride, come out here and do all these things that I've been told by people who don't do these things are not necessary. They make me happy and they bring me joy. Um, again, the two are not, they're synonymous, but they're not the same. Look at this. Look at these beautiful flowers. And again, my wife and our son and myself, the thing we love most about all of this beauty here is that we use our hands to create it and plant it. And so uh, a lot of people 
never understand happiness is based upon the result or the outcome of an event and joy is a state of being that we must focus on achieving ourselves in our own lives and a lot of this is because of where we come from our upbringing i have a sister who's a counselor and she puts it well she says basically the first three years of our lives were like a projector just recording all the events that take place around us and that builds the uh format the blueprint, if you will, of what we think life's supposed to be like. So if you're brought up in an environment, say where maybe one parent has BPD or some other mental health condition and they don't get help, uh, and the other kind of plays the role of the gatekeeper, um, making sure nobody bashes their delusions, making sure no one else comes in and says, well, that thing you think about that is kind of, uh, it ain't really so, and it's kind of crazy. Uh, you don't really need to catastrophize that because it's really a molehill, it's not a mountain. Well, the gatekeeper's role is to make sure those people aren't allowed in because when they're gone, that gatekeeper who lives with that person who has BPD and who doesn't get help, they they pay for it because that's a whooping boy. Use the example, and back to Patricia Burgess, uh, she's from Arkansas, and she commented on that video because I compared and contrasted the, the Clinton brothers, Bill Clinton and Roger Clinton and how I honestly believe their mother had BPD because there's no gray area with these people. Everything's either all good or it's all bad. There's nothing in between, even if it's your children. And I, I honestly believe Bill Clinton was the, the good child. He was the one that was told, you're going to be great. You're going to do great things. You're going to change the world. You're going to end up being president of the United States someday. And I believe Roger Clinton spent his childhood being told, you're a worthless piece of crap. You're never going to amount to anything. You're probably going to be a drug addict and in and out of prison when you grow up. Well, and that's what he did. Um, Patricia Burgess uh, actually commented that she's from down there in Arkansas, and she actually knows uh, Roger Clinton. She's known him for a long time, and that's exactly how he was brought up. And she said she was so happy to hear me make that summation because I, I don't guess anybody's ever made that connection before. And a lot of it is because even 20 years ago, well, gosh, Bill Clinton, 30 years ago when he was in office, we didn't know about BPD. If somebody had it and they had a breakdown or they're going off the rails, a doctor would generally give them sleeping pills and tell them to rest for a week. And they just go take these pills and, and, and sleep for a week and then they come out the next week. And then the week after that, they'd start going off the rails again. Uh, and then people, of course, would learn to avoid, stay away from but if you're one of those that are trapped in that environment, that becomes your norm. So what's my point of this? Uh, the book, Ethan Frome, really pointed out how if you're in that situation, there is no way to win. The only way you can win is if you get the hell out of there for your own sanity and for your own safety. Um, I wish the movie would have shown that because I'm sure more there are more people that watch movies than, than you got to read the book. It's only 105 pages long. Ethan Frome, simple read, easy read. I read it in two days because I stay so active with everything else. I could have read it in a day if I hadn't. Maybe three or four hours of total reading time. Uh, in the book, and here comes a big spoiler alert. I never saw this coming because you don't really figure this in thing out until the end. Edith Wharton is an amazing author. I'm glad I've got more novels of hers I've bought and short story collections up there I've been reading. I mean, I'm just, she's really, this is the first time I've gotten excited about an author that I'm not, that I'm not familiar with uh, in years. She's really that good. She's dead. She's been long dead. Uh, um, first woman to win a Pulitzer. Uh, in the book, he finally comes to the realization that he doesn't want to live with someone who is so ill and who, who has no intentions to seek help. And back then, I'm sure there was no help. There is today, and you can get it. Um, but he, he, he didn't want to leave her because he felt that that was not the right thing to do. He felt so sorry for her because he knew there... He felt there was no one who could take care of her because she was so sickly. He had believed her lies. He had believed, he, yeah, you're living in chronic pain or yeah, you've got this chronic illness. And because it's a disease, it's a mental health disease that affects every single person who is in the environment with the person who has it. So him and this young girl, they had once upon a time, they decided they were going to go sleigh riding down this hill where everybody in a small uh, fictitious uh, town in Massachusetts named Starkfield 
goes sleigh riding, but they never did. Well, he's riding her to the train, taking her to the train stop because the wife is determined she's getting rid of her because all of a sudden she's she's the bad housekeeper and she's going to bring in another girl because this other girl's the good housekeeper. Um, hey, the young girl, she wasn't the best, but she was an okay housekeeper. Uh, but you got BPD, there's no such thing as okay. There's no such thing as moderate. It's either all good or all bad. So she gives this young girl the ax. Her, the husband's taking her to the station and he doesn't want her to go because he's in love with her, not so much uh, because of romance, but because she has shown him life doesn't have to be filled with misery and abuse and mistreatment and constantly going out, seeing doctors day after day, trying to find maybe the next medication will be the one to work. The girl, these days we'd call her a drug seeker, uh, the woman, somebody who was always going to a doctor claiming to have these things they didn't just so they could get more opioids or whatever. Um, narcotics but since he felt it was not the right thing to do him and this girl they stopped they went sleigh riding and there was this big elm tree at the bottom of the hill and everybody was always afraid somebody was going to hit it and get killed and so they went down they barely missed the elm and then they came back up and it was like instantaneously they decided that life a life lived without each other was not a life worth living um, and, and two, the guy didn't have, his finances were a mess because the woman was such a drain. She didn't produce, she wasn't productive, she didn't earn, and all she wanted to do was spend money on doctors seeking drugs. And, and so he was broke, despite his best efforts. So he didn't have the money to just leave anyway. So they decided a life living without each other is not worth living. So they made a, like a suicide pact on the spot to go down this hill as fast as they could and hit the tree. And so that's what they did. And at the very last moment, I got to show you this privet. These are beautiful flowers. At the very last moment, it's like he, he had, I think it's just the natural instinct of the human body to veer away from danger. He jerked away just enough to where when they hit the tree at full speed, it didn't kill him, but it ended up permanently disfiguring and disabling both of them. Ethan Frame could still, like if you watch the movie, Liam Neeson plays the role and it was filmed in 1993, so he was a much younger man than he is now. Seeing how his career turned out and seeing how great of an actor he became, it's amazing to go watch him in 1993, and I've never seen the movie. He plays the role of Ethan Frame so well, it's like, wow. It, it's easy to see that why this guy turned out to be a great actor, because he's a great actor, even back in 1993. The way he walks with the disfigured limp and he, he's like oh, wow what happened to this guy but the girl the young girl she's bedridden for the rest of her life and they're both now stuck with the abusive crazy wife who's got bpd who ironically when there's no one there to take care of her she's mysteriously able to take care of herself and she spends the rest of her life and their lives taking care of them and edith Wharton's message was, I fully believe, and this is where Hollywood messed it up, because Hollywood gave the other message. Hollywood gave the message, you know, this middle-aged Caucasian male's a pig. Look at him going out, leaving his poor old lady to go chase this younger girl. That's not what happened. And Ethan, or, or Edith uh, Wharton never sent that message. I honestly believe her message was, look, if you're in a miserable situation and you're with a lunatic, there's no way to win. The only thing you can do is escape. And, and at the end of the story, they, he refused to escape and he ended up getting the young girl entrapped in his same case of misery and they lived out the rest of their lives in utter misery. Heartbreaking tale. Here's the good news. That was written 96 years ago. Yeah, 96 years ago. The good news is that now, almost a century later, there's help. Um, but no one can can seek help except for the person that has a condition and needs it. And the thing about BPD is those are the people who are most likely uh, least to get help because they think everybody else in the world has a problem, not them. I can look back on my own life when I finally started to figure this out out of nearly after nearly 40 years of surrounding myself with toxic people because I came from a toxic background and that's all I knew. Then I got with my beautiful bride dearly, a.k.a. Uh, Giggly Girl. I was over in the Philippines, completely different culture. I, it's like I had to dump all this stuff out of my brain because they don't live the way over there. We live over here. A lot of similarities, but the culture is very different. And I had to learn it because I was there. I was stuck. I had no money, nobody to send me money. Um, I, I, for many years, I didn't think I was ever going to see the United States again. 
but I got with a woman that actually loved me uh, unconditionally. It wasn't, well, I'll love you as long as you have money. She had some of her best Filipina friends telling her, why are you with that guy? He's broke. If you're going to be with an American, you may as well be with a rich American. Otherwise, you may as well just be with a Filipino because at least then you don't have to speak English. Her best friends were telling her this. And she said, because I love this guy. I don't, I'm not with him. Yeah, I know he's broke. I know he doesn't have any money. I know he's crazy from the war. But I love him. And I, honest to God, believe that she loved me back to life. And then our son came, and she and him loved me back to life. And she finally convinced me, stop focusing on the garbage and the trash and the toxicity of your past and the good things. you've. There's a lot of wonderful people that I wish I, I hadn't lost from my past. Um, she said, learn to focus on the beauty of life, the, the, the life you have now and what we have now. And that's what I did, and it built, and it built, and it built. And now we have this, and, and, and we, we have joy. Our trees bring us happiness. Planting our trees, coming out and weeding the trees, taking care of the trees brings us happiness. But even if the weeds were all grown up and we didn't get down here to cut them, and, and we, we still live a life filled with joy because we are in that state of being. My wife doesn't depend upon me to make her happy. She's got her own ways to make herself happy, and she lives in a state of joy because she came from, you know, she came from a very poor family, but they were a very loving family. It wasn't the type, I mean, I, without getting too personal, uh, I, my projector recorded, uh, okay, uh, you're supposed to argue a lot, um, never say I love you, never show any sort of, uh, lovey-dovey type affection and a day that passes where there's at least no argument is a good day but the anxiety level goes up because you're waiting for the other shoe to drop if there was no argument today tomorrow's might be worse than it usually is my wife came from a family where even though they didn't have money sometimes they didn't have food they had each other and they loved each other and they didn't take any unhappy situations or unpleasant situations out on each other and their family members they banded together and they loved each other and they loved each other through the situation and so it's like i relearned it's like so when i was in the philippines and i dumped all this stuff out of my mind and i restarted my my projector so i would know how to safely live there um this is the stuff i started recording and i started realizing my wife is right and i realized like ethan frame realized in the book Life doesn't have to be miserable, and if you're, if you're with people or if you've surrounded yourself with people, and I've spent nearly 40 years up until that time surrounding myself with toxic people because it's what I knew, um, stop. Stop doing it. Do what Ethan Frame should have done and just get the hell out despite any, anything. Just get away from there for your own safety and for, your, for the sake of your own livelihood. And... Uh, when I left the Philippines, or when I left the United States to go to the Philippines, I walked away from everything, all my possessions. Uh, I, I walked away from a tr truck that was paid for because I was in a s s lunaticish situation and the only answer was to get the hell out, and I did. And after reading that book, I have come to the cl conclusion, which I already knew, it was the smartest thing I've ever done in my life. Um, I have a life filled with joy and that same joy is out there waiting for everybody, but we've got to find it on our own. We can't depend upon a partner to lead us to it. Even though my partner kind of led me to it. I got lucky. I'm telling you, I am lucky. My wife is a one in 10 billion girls. Uh, there's not a lot of people like her out there, but they are out there, but, but mainly you can't change other people. You're not gonna. And they might make you feel as if they're, oh yeah, okay, oh yeah, uh-huh. No, they're just stringing you along more and more and more and more. You know, finish with this. <sighs> Be bold enough to make the uncomfortable, unpleasant changes that you need to make to live a life filled with joy that's out there waiting for you, despite how bad and how uncomfortable it might be between point A and point B, and don't wait to do it. I don't care if you're almost 60. Time's running out. Actually, the older you are, probably the quicker you ought to make it.
y'all to make these choices and make these changes because we only get one shot at life. And let me tell you, as a man who for the last 10 years has lived a life of nothing but joy, despite during some of those times having no money, having no food, uh, having severe challenges, I was 9,000 miles away from home with no way to get over here. But when I got rid of the toxicity, started focusing on the positive, focusing on the love, pursuing my passions, doing the things I was always told I would never be good at. That was a pipe dream, thinking I could write a book good enough for a lot of people to want to read it, thinking I could start a YouTube channel, get enough, you know, going on 300,000 subscribers, up to 5 million views a month, enough to actually be able to live this lifestyle full time. Hey, man, if someone says that's not possible and so many people did, that's their opinion. That's got nothing to do with me. What other people think of us is absolutely none of our business. Let's make the choice to live a life filled with joy, and let's make the choice not to wait. Get out there and do it now. And I got some more trees to take care of, so I'll see you some for some more next time.